Hey, everybody, I'm Nick Latum. And I'm Leah Bonima. And we're the hosts of Were You Raised by Wolves? Each week, we try to make the world a kinder, nicer place. Well, that's the idea, at least. I mean, we try. Have you ever wondered what to do if you're ghosted? Or what to do when a friend asks you to borrow money? Or the proper way to eat Cheetos? You know, the big questions. So please find Were You Raised by Wolves wherever you listen. If you're a farmer in New York State, join the New York State Grown and Certified program to let people know your food is grown right, right here. Learn more at certified.ny.gov. Hi, this is Katie Kiefer from What Doesn't Kill You, Food Industry Insights, and you're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in once again to the Heritage Radio Network. We are coming to you, as always, live from the back of Roberta's Pizza here in Bushwick, Brooklyn. You, of course, are listening to The Farm Report, and I'm your host, Erin Fairbanks. And we are in studio today with a very special guest all the way from Israel, Alon Chipon. Um, Alon, welcome to the studio. Hi, it's great to be here. So I'm excited. We are going to be tucking into a conversation around um, sustainability as it relates to proteins um, and probably spending a little bit of time focusing on beef. Um, Alone is a Ph.D. candidate with the Wiseman Institute of Science in the Department of Environmental and Plant Scientists. He is also a co-founder of the Israeli Forum for Sustainable Nutrition. So I think it's safe to say We can assume he knows his stuff, but we'll find out. (laughs) Um, So, Alon, how did you get into uh, studying food? Where did that come from? It's a great question. It's kind of a coincidence. I've been working a lot with the environment for many years. So I started off as a physicist and then moved on to doing research in environment. And then several years ago, I was working at the Weizmann Institute and... I ran into uh, an amazing person by the name of Guido Neschel. So he's a professor here, he's an Israeli living in the States. And we have similar backgrounds also. And he's been devoting his work for many years on issues of food and environment. And I was then working with my advisor, Professor Ron Milo, and we were looking a lot about issues of how to actually quantify costs of of various things that are related to the environment, what would be the environmental cost of products. And when we met Giddy, we kind of shifted into working on uh, issues related to food. So was that because um, food has a big environmental impact or there wasn't a ton of great research there or you kind of had a passion for eating? Like why was food the right space to kind of focus your efforts? It's a good question. I mean, at that time, I really didn't know a lot about food. It took me a while. We had such a great connection with Guido, and it seemed like there was so much work to be done on those issues. But when I started off, I really didn't know a lot about food. But as my research and and understanding grew, I I was kind of... it, It was just amazing to see how much... Uh, more research has to be done and how the environmental impacts of food are so large and people are unaware of that, especially in the environmental community Mm -hmm. and also at the other parts of um, fields that people are associated, I mean, are are connected with food, for for example, dietitians. So it seems like a lot of people are doing uh, work that is related to food, but it seems like it's not connected. People don't understand the whole picture. And I think as scientists, we try to bring, at least I do, try to link all these different fields into kind of one emerging understanding of how food relates to everything. Yeah, I feel like that's very similar to, you know, our goals here at the Heritage Radio Network is oftentimes people who uh, work really in any field, you know, you kind of get a little bit of the like blinders on and you're like really looking in these kind of silos at these different things. And um, one of the fascinating things about looking at environmental impacts 
is it forces you to like zoom way out and think really broadly and really creatively about all the different kind of factors and impacts. So does your work focus specifically, it, it focus specifically on um, protein production in the U.S., or how did you kind of put boundaries on what you were going to look at when you were getting started? So our work focuses on the American food system, and it in particular looks about livestock production in general. So protein is one aspect, but also calories and other aspects that are related to uh, animal production. So the American food system is very unique. It's very industrialized. It's very economic efficient. Uh, but when we started off, we thought that we might get immediate answers to some of the questions we, that we were posing. For example, we, we ask really simple questions, for example, like any one of us does every day in the morning, you know, when we start, what should I eat? Right. And we were looking at it from an environmental perspective. So I wasn't looking how, on issues that also actually determine how we choose like taste, emotions, cultures. We were looking at it from an environmental perspective. And first of all, we found that most of the data that the USDA publishes was not enough for us to answer these questions. We found that the existing research out there was more kind of aggregated. So they would talk about meat, talk about plants, but how does but meat is a very general term. What about dairy, eggs? Right. What about pork related to poultry? What about beef? So then we started kind of drilling down and trying to understand how these relate to one another, what, what would be their environmental performance. And we wanted to link that to actually what people consume. So the results, even when we kind of wanted to convey this message, was always in relation to the amount of calories that people eat. So I don't, we, we didn't want kind of to come out and say, you know, beef emits this and this tons of CO2. It doesn't relate to our life, but if I tell you that a per calorie, this is the amount of uh, uh, emission, then you can tell because you're a consumer, you talk a lot about calories, protein, then you can actually relate to these results. Yeah, like you right now could tell me that beef literally emits, uh, a, you know, a thousand whatever or a hundred or a hundred thousand and that like has, I mean, essentially in a real way, like no context for me to like understand. I'm like, okay, is that a lot? Is that a little? How does it relate? Right. Um, so you guys were looking at dairy, beef, poultry, pork, and eggs, and right. trying to ascertain kind of the environmental, you know, impact of those proteins, and you're measuring it per calorie per gram. And also per protein. Per protein. Okay. Right. And the idea was, again, it's like you say, I try not to talk about numbers because it, it's really hard for us to grasp the numbers and tell us, but when you, when I convey this message, message, for example, that beef is more resource intensive by about tenfold than the other livestock, you get that. I get you that. You understand that. Yeah. And when I tell you that plants... And it bumps cal- me out because I really like to eat hamburgers. <laughs> so we're going to come back to that. But anyway, you were saying plants yeah. per calorie. And plants per calories and per protein are usually better for the environment in terms of their performance. Uh, well, maybe with the exception of water, because we found that feed, for example, is, is mostly rain-fed. So it, in terms of irrigated water, we mm-hmm. don't need a lot of that. But let's put that aside for a minute. This is, uh, so you get these messages. You understand that. You understand that beef is resource-intense compared to the other alternatives that are out there. It doesn't really matter if it's 14 or 10 or 5, but you have to understand that, for example, beef is much more uh, resource-intense compared to the amount of calories and protein that you're getting. Right. So, and then just to kind of back up for a second here, you know, to get beef, we need to have a steer. For a steer to grow, they need to have, you know, food to eat. And essentially they're eating grains and grasses and drinking water. Uh, Same for chickens, same for pigs um, and chickens, whether they're being raised for meat or for eggs. So, I think the, the the thing when you're looking at kind of uh, calories in versus calories out for livestock is that they need to consume a lot of calories, whereas like a stock of corn is not consuming any calories to be grown, right? Like, so, so is the that idea, like so the idea? So that's moving on. So one reflect reflecting the the results that we got, so you can understand if beef is more resource intensive, it means it le- needs a lot of more feed, right? Meat feed because it needs land and more irrigated water. By the way, the water that they consume uh-huh. is not the big issue here. Issue. It's the water that goes into 
producing the feed, not what the, the animals consume. What they consume is a very small portion of, of the water. So it's the water that is used to grow the corn Exactly. Or Most of the environmental the burdens beginning. are at the agriculture uh, uh, stage, with the exception of greenhouse gas emissions, which actually occur throughout the life uh, stages of the animals, especially uh, cows that also emit methane, and also the whole part of the manure, what we call manure management, right. also has a lot of emissions. But with the exception of that, most of the burdens are at the agricultural stage. Now, when afterwards, when we wanted to interpret the results that we got, we wanted to, to have this kind of overall view of the food system. Mm -hmm. So we look at all the different feed that is growing in the United States, and then we look at how it kind of translates into food through the animals. Right. And we see this kind gigantic mismatch in terms of feed calories and what food calories comes out. And this is very, very inefficient. So we're talking about, on average, an we call it efficiency conversion of somewhere around 7%. So what it means is that, on average, there's variations between the animals, but on average, for every 100 calories of feed that these animals eat, we only get on the table about 7 calories. So, uh, but keep in mind that we are not, we cannot eat these feed calories. Right. They're mostly consumed of maize. Right. But when I do this calculus, you see that there is uh, an uh, 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 astounding kind of inefficiency from moving from feed to food. From feed to food. And, you know, assuming we were not growing feed for uh, livestock, we could use that like arable land for other types of production. Exactly. So this... So this is actually where my current research focuses, and th this is the whole field of dietary shifts. So what does it mean? So it means that if we look at what people are consuming today, usually we call it dietary preferences, kind of a very academic word for diets or what people eat, and we look into shifts, changing those diets' habits, we can try to find diets that lo use less, for example, land resources and mm -hmm. give maybe the same amount of calories. And on those spared land, we can actually grow more, more food. And that is, in this context, we see that we can produce more food from the current system by just changing diets. And my, my last research actually says that if people would be consuming, for example, poultry instead of beef, providing the same calories and protein, we would be able on those spared lands to produce uh, food, full diets, to meet the demands of somewhere between 120, 140 million people. That's about 40% of the entire population in the United States, just by making this shift from beef and poultry. Now, it's imaginary maybe, it may be undoable, but the, the idea is to highlight this potential of just changing this incremental change in the diet. And, and I think it really opens your mind to understanding how inefficient the system is and what is the potential of us producing more food? So I have, um, when you are thinking, of, like me as a consumer, as like someone who's eating in my body, you know, um, I know uh, there's like a one school of thought that's like a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. There's another school of thought that like, uh, you know, the nutritional benefits of a calorie of, you know, a, from a carrot or from a hamburger or from whatever art, different. Um, did that play into your evaluation, like kind of the, the nutritional density of a calorie outside of that, like measurement of essentially calorie as like a fuel source? Does that make sense? Not really. A okay. calorie is a calorie. A calorie is, a is calorie. an energy unit. It's an okay? energy unit. It's an un energy unit. Now, of course, we have to understand that this reductionism of taking food and dividing it into its nutrients you know, we, can u we need to use that in some ways, but we have to understand that at the end, people eat food, and right. not calories or protein. Right. So uh, measuring things in calories or in protein has its downsides as well. But it's a way of highlighting some of the, major, uh, some of the nutrients that people do need to look out. Right. Um, and of course, for example, I'll give you another example. We did look, for example, at the differences. Uh, so I, I, I talked about... Um, substituting beef to moving from beef to poultry. We mm -hmm. also tried to look what, w what it, it would mean if we changed that to a plant-based diet. Right. So, for example, we see that the spared lands of this dietary transition, 
of moving to a plant diet that gives us the same kind of nut- nutritional package as beef does translate to producing more food close to 200 million people. Right. And when we look at the, different, dif- the differences between that plain, plant-based based diet, which is mostly made up of legume, for example, mm-hmm. and we compare that to beef, we see that from a nutritional point of view, not only calories or protein, we do get a lot of benefits. Right. Because beef is, is a very, um, it's a very important, uh, 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 consist- uh, something that comes in a diet, it's very, very important. But when we get a variety of plant-based crops that substitute beef, we could be getting a lot more nutrients in that substitution. Yeah, that's that is what I assume. I just I think yes. it's like important to acknowledge. Um, also, so I know uh, you know there's also I think in general in the U.S. you know we have a long history as a proud beef eating country. You know, like steers and the wide open range and kind of hamburgers and steaks are very like you know tied into our kind of cultural identity and yet shifts are happening. I think it was like 2014 that like poultry surpassed beef as like the most consumed protein in the U.S. So, you know, those things are are not set in stone and are are kind of shifting. But I think there's a real confusion for the average consumer, and I would include myself in this, of like, you know, you hear all these different things about like how, I, how I'm supposed to be eating and what I'm supposed to be eating. And especially when it comes to environmental impacts, Um, you know, there's like all of a sudden, you know, almonds are the worst thing ever created. And, you know, beef is like, has a huge impact and it gets a little bit, um, overwhelming to, to kind of make choices and kind of a day-to-day basis. And also to understand kind of the, um, intentions of the, those messages, like kind of who's behind it. So I want to clarify for folks like your you know, you're coming at this as a scientific pursuit. You're not a secret vegan evangelist who's like... No, not at all. <laughs> and it's, it's just important it's Just important for me to maybe uh, um, uh, um, say something of what you just said. Yeah. The reason decisions are so difficult is because there's so many factors that come into play when we make these decisions every day. It's not only the environment. Think about it. It's culture. It's health. Right. It's emotions. It's memories. And all these kind of things come together for this split second when we decide what to eat in the morning. And sometimes it's conflicting because, you know, you're on a diet, but you love that so much. And, oh, you remember that someone told you that from an environmental perspective, it's not good to eat. Oh, but God, do I love this? I have to eat a little bit of that cake now. But, and these food is so in, in part of our culture, everyday activities. We're all consumers and we have to make those choices even if we want to or not. Right. And that's why it's it's so difficult to integrate all this information yeah. into very basic decisions but every tell day. Tell me what to do. I don't want to think so hard. I just want to have dinner and feel good about it and feel like I'm giving my family something nutritious and I am can afford it and I'm making the right choice for the environment. And you So know. I, think, I think what's what's actually... Let me try to help you. And I, I Please. Think, <laughs> uh, and I think... Um, other people have done a better job than I did, but I'll try to I'll try to con- convey this message. I think at the heart, the messages are always very simple. It's us that always try to complicate that. It always comes down, I think, to having very basic whole foods, mostly plant based, very little meat. We don't have to, you know, entirely forget that or stop eating completely, but just reduce them. And, and eat whole foods that are healthy, less processed, and they're also good for the environment in terms of plant-based. Right. And there are out there many families of crops that have been neglected in our diets everywhere. Look at the legume family. They come up again and again in all these analyses that we do. They both give you a high nutrient profile. Also, a very they're very good for in terms of environmental performance, sure. and yet they've been very much neglected in diets everywhere. Where I come from, the legumes have been part of an integral part of the Mediterranean diet, and they're on, on decline in all the diets in Israel, and even here. I mean, here, for example, beans have been part of the diets of Native Americans. How many people are eating beans? Not much. Not much. I will say I did make some really lovely bean soup for lunch today with a heirloom variety called Jacob's Cattle. 
um, that is like on the slow food arc of taste. So I'm excited personally to be eating some beans with a little bit of bacon <laughs> for, lunch, <laughs> for lunch this afternoon. <laughs> um, but uh, so I want to shift gears a little bit here and um, talk about kind of uh, your approach with regards to um, information and data collection. Because one of the things I read was that, you know, when you initially were looking at kind of what information was out there to um, kind of shape your approach, that that the that they're just the things were old things were outdated that there wasn't like a lot of recent information because the uh, way we produce food in particular in the u.s has changed so much in the last 50 years is that like how did that can you can you talk a little bit more about so that i think there's a couple of issues that we need to talk about now it's kind of this outreach right. first of all i think as scientists we have this uh i think it's an obligation for us to convey the message and try to get it out there for the, the public. When we came out with our first publication of this work a couple of years ago, we were stunned to find out that it was nearly in any every daily journal around the world. I'm talking about everyday journals, not uh, scientific ones. So people are really, really interested. And there, people are looking for this information. I, I think that for years, maybe scientists were not conveying or not, well, for one, they were not doing enough research, but I think that has changed in recent years, especially about livestock and food. There's a growing work. I think we know a lot more than we did 10, 20 years ago. But also in conveying the message to the public, if we leave our results out there on journals, leave them in, in, in the scientific community, we are not really going to make a change in the world. We have to go out there and try to make um, sense to, to people like you or right. the, the public on what our results are actually trying to say. Right. So it, it, I think there's, a, there's many factors that come together as to why there's not enough of this information, simple information out there. And also I think the public for many years was not really looking for this information. There's a growing awareness everywhere here in the States, back in Israel. People really want to know where their food comes from. It's growing. We're still not seeing enough people understanding or wanting to know, but it is growing, and we should kind of more uh, um, encourage people to understand that. Well, I think, too, in, you know, kind of in line with some other U.S. history is that we are, you know, now kind of exporting our systems of livestock production to other right. countries around the world. So if things are having these kind of uh, gross environmental impacts that, you know, are we are we setting up other countries for kind of, you know, it's all, ex it can like grow exponentially as um, other spots around the world change their diets to more mirror our diets and their food production to more mirror our food production. Right. So th th this is an important point that you're making. And I often been asked about this. So how does your work relate to other places in the world? So, for one, we have to keep in mind that not everywhere in the world people grow animals or rear animals, actually, in the same way that the Americans do. There's some more uh, extensive systems out there, grazing systems. They have a different function in third world countries, and we have to make that distinguishment uh, here at, at this point. But on the other hand, we have to understand that some systems, for example, the Chinese food systems, they are moving into this kind of industrialized system because they want to continue and produce more meat for their population. There's a growing consumption of meat. So they are likely to move in many ways, in many paths, towards this kind of climax. I call it climax because from an economic efficiency point of view, it is a sort of a climax system where uh, the production is pretty much the same. So in that sense, I think the work here that we've done actually reflects on possible you know, future food systems that might come out there. It might not be exact, but it gives us kind of a, an understanding what we're looking at. Right. So the other thing I want to talk about a little bit is looking at pasture-based systems, grass-fed systems, because I'm sure this is the other thing that comes up. And what I feel like we as consumers have been told and, and understand is like, the if you're looking that when we're talking about bad environmental impacts, we're primarily talking about uh, confinement operations, feedlot operations. We're not talking about pasture-based systems, um, but is that is that really the case? Can you dis can you tell? Are there like real differences between a pasture-based um, 
you know, livestock operation and a confinement from an environmental standpoint? Of course there is. But I think in the United States, it less stands out because even pasture-based systems here in the States, first of all, they're a niche kind of market. So it's not like we're mass producing it. We're still producing beef in, in this uh, uh, industrial systems. But when you look at pasture-based, especially because of the climate and conditions here, they still eat a lot of feed. Yeah. Okay? So they're, when you talk about pasture-based systems, you can look at what happens in third world countries. Look, for example, in China, there are places that people grow pigs in their backyard. They give them scraps and byproducts. So in, in terms of environmental performance, it's the best, it's optimal. But this is not the case for, I would say, most pasture-based systems here in the States, this niche market. I might be wrong. Maybe there are exceptions. But even here, they still need a lot of feed to produce. Yeah, I would say the majority of, like, pasture-based systems are you're maybe spending a chunk of time on grass and they're still getting finished on grain. I think it's also, I always try to point this out, is there's not really, like, pasture-raised pork, it's not really a thing as it relates to what pigs are eating. I, I feel like there's not a, there's not like grass fed pigs out there. That's no, like, that's no. not a thing. No, and I because feel like it's like, they are not ruminants. They yeah. don't, they don't eat grass. But I feel like that's the thing that people very much are like, oh, I know it's a grass fed pig. I'm like, that is no, not I a thing. I don't know of any of <laughs> that. But even, even the, the grass fed uh, beef that are actually slaughtered on the grass in that sense you know, the winter, winter time here, they need to eat on something. They will eat on feed. And mm-hmm. that feed was grown on agricultural land. Now, how much of that uh, in terms of the regular production, conventional production? I'm not really sure. I think it varies a lot. Also, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, there has been kind of differing reports on how they're better. They're not necessarily better because they take longer, they, they take more time. Time to grow out. Yeah, and then to... So in that sense, I have to put all the entire additional time in that factoring of greenhouse gas emissions. So it's hard to say that you gain a lot in terms of these uh, metrics. You do gain a lot in terms of crop plants. Uh, I would assume that in some ways, if you are using a little bit less feed, maybe you get some benefits because then you free a little bit more crop plants. But again, because they do need feed during the winter time. It's hard to say exactly if you're reaping any large benefits. I might you're just not going to give me permission to guilt-free eat a all. hamburger. No, all only right. if you move to Africa. All right. Only well, if you, move you to know, Africa. okay. That, you know, that would be a but, big shift, but okay. <laughs> but, but keep in mind there that these systems, for example, if we move to talk about Africa and grazers, they don't eat animals on a daily basis like we do here. Right. These animals have a different function at all. They serve them as as assets, as collateral, as credit. It's like the bank. It's it's like the bank. It's 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 also it's also a big refrigerator for a rainy day. So imagine you have famine. Only in these situations would they are likely to maybe eat meat, but they certainly will not eat it on a daily basis as we do um, here, for example. So. Um I was reading the uh, abstract of the paper that got sent over, connecting the dots between livestock, their environmental burdens, dietary preferences, and food security in the U.S. And in the very first paragraph, um, you guys, you know, drop the information about kind of adequately feeding nine plus billion humans. Mm-hmm. Um, and the need to kind of rethink food production and consumption. And I, I always chafe at the, I always chafe at the kind of panic is like too strong a word, but like, I I feel like we, you hear this, like, okay, we're going to be, you know, 9 billion people by 2050. We're going to have to figure out a way to produce more food is Mm -hmm. how, and then, and I'm often like, who's putting that kind of message out there and, and like, because and I'm like I'm coming around to a point here, so bear with okay. me. Um, bearing, bearing. <laughs> um, because <laughs> in the U.S., you know, we are essentially wasting between thirty and forty percent of our food from, you know, field to fork. So I often find this idea that our efforts need to be so focused on producing more food very confusing when we're essentially throwing away so much of it. And I'm wondering if you guys have looked at all at the kind of 
environmental impacts of the waste stream um, as it relates to livestock? I mean, obviously you're looking at kind of the impacts of manure, but like of just of like how how we kind of like use these animals and and the like uh, different pieces and parts of them um and you know there's a lot in there as far as, like, as, it, as it relates you're, to you're, waste you're making an excellent argument and first of all let me make, like let me make it clear when we talk about these projections of needing to almost double food production these are scenarios that are it's important to to realize that but these are business as usual predictions they take into account the growing population, but also the changing diets of third world countries that are likely to consume more calories and protein. So it's kind of this projection that we're putting out there. It doesn't mean that it's it's the reality. There's a lot of us, a lot of things that we can do to change that. So, but we need to understand this projection in order to tackle it. So that's one point to make. There's been several solutions throughout the years done by many researchers that talk about how we can tackle this issue. One of them is addressing food loss. So if we are producing food loss, it means that we're producing a lot more than we actually need, right? So this is one solution to tackle the issue of more production. Another one is what I mentioned, dietary shifts. So I show by these uh, results that if people change their diets, we can actually be producing more food using the same resource. So this is another kind of important point. And third, and I part, don't disagree with no, you. No, no. I just I'm want to make like, a last yeah, point. Yeah. Food security is not only about producing food. Today we are producing roughly the se- the amount of calories to feed all people in the world, and yet we have about a billion people who are, ma- who are malnourished. So it means that now most of the problem is not about production, but distribution, by access, by utilization, by stability. These are the pillars of food security. So my research does not focus on all these stages. They're very important. You're only one person. I understand. (laughs) I'm looking, but I'm just showing that the system now has the potential to produce more food. And of course, we need to tackle it in all the, uh, the various dimensions to really make sure that people get that food. Um, on the kind of, I'm curious if you've looked at, because I know, you know, with, um, beef in particular and other livestock to, I think a lesser extent that the, there's a lot of non edible, uh, assets that are, are part of, you know, you, you have like leather from hides and, um, looking at kind of, um, the two, I think, of a much lesser degree, like the way we use different parts of animals for other kind of uh, beauty or health or medicinal purposes. Like, um, obviously, you look at the carcass of a steer, and there is, you know, I, I think I'm guessing here. I think it's around 25 percent of it is, you know. Is tossed away. It's tossed or unused. away or unused, or or there's like not really systems set up to kind of capture those things that we used to use when we were like operating in kind of smaller scale um, ways. Of course. So the results that I talked about before about this inefficiency from feed to food yeah. also captures this inefficiency in usage of the animal, as you mentioned. So today, the the choices that we make in, in eating only very small parts of the animals, they do come into this calculation. Obviously, there's a, enough, there's a lot of room for, uh, uh, for using more of the, what we call offals. That's the word. Now, I, I remember reading about it. There was, uh, I think, last year, a very important uh, uh, symposium in Oxford that the whole theme of the conference was devoted to offals and what we can do. And there were cooks and chefs and, say, and you know, I heard they were offering uh, blood sorbet to show that people can eat the blood of animals and even in in, in various ways. So, you know, it's not my thing, thing, but it just shows that there is are things that we can do, even in the current system, to to actually make it to improve in terms of food security, food production. But yet, this conversion from feed to food will always be less than direct consumption. So we can we can increase the efficiency of the current system, but up to a certain limit. Right. We're never going to... It's unlikely that we're going to find a way to pull more calories out of 
of the system. Although, no, we can. We can. That's what I'm saying. We okay. can use more parts of it. Right. But, but direct consumption will will likely always be a better uh, way to go. That, and we also have to realize, you know, we have to to uh, to say that you know people will not be moving completely to eating only plant based diets without any animals. So we have to think of all these, you know these potentials, mm -hmm. but also be practical in understanding where we can make those shifts that people are likely to take. Well, I think too, like you look at kind of um, the way we have pursued uh, genetics in livestock where I, I think it's Tyson has buried or, you know, a few years ago had buried somewhere on their website um, looking at the amount of feed it took to grow a meat bird out to a five pound you know bird that you would put on your table and the amount of time that would take and through kind of selective breeding they were able to produce an animal that got you know larger faster on less feed um And I, you know, I also, I also, I don't know with regard, it, there's other impacts that that like genetic, um, that selective breeding has had for the animal in particular. Um, but I, and, and I, I, my, my gut is that we're at the kind of outer limits of our ability to, um, you know, to, in, for, for poultry anyway, to, to, to be more efficient in that conversion space. Right, right. Of course, I think this selective pressure also has its, you know, its down downsides. Big you downsides, know? yeah. And I don't think the animals are very. I think they're miserable in many ways, because they are kind of selected to actually be a meat factory and not to be a living animal. And again, of course, maybe we can do some more adjustments, or maybe, but there will be a limit, and that's because biology kicks in. Animals are also. Um, creatures that eat, that live, that breathe, they cannot convert everything to meat. They're not perfect converters. And eating straight from the field will always be, probably from an energetic, caloric protein pro uh, point of view, will always be more efficient. Yeah. So again, realizing that people might not convert all their diets to plant-based, we still uh, would like to see that people eat more plant-based. More plant-based. They're more healthy reduce consumption of, of animals uh, and and if you do consume animals, try to go into more efficient one. Go for poultry instead of beef. That will likely give you uh, benefits in, in, in health and also environment. So we come back to a statement you made earlier that it's, in the end it's actually, even though we've spit a lot of stuff out at you guys, in the end it's actually not that complicated. Like, you know, eat Michael real food. Michael Pollan says that. <laughs> eat he real says food. That. Michael Pollan says that much better than I do. Yeah. What is it? Eat, eat, eat real food, mostly mostly plants, a little bit of meat, and, uh, and yeah. enjoy it. And enjoy it. And enjoy it. So, see, guys, it's not that complicated. We just we just took you on a little bit journey to bring you back to something you already knew. Um, Alon, thank you so much. It has been such a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much. It was a pleasure. If you guys want to follow um, more of his work, you can find it via the Weissman Institute of Science or the Israeli Forum for Sustainable Nutrition. So definitely check that out. We are going to take a quick break to hear a word from uh, the supporters of our network, the folks who help keep our light on and are also doing amazing work. When we come back, we will be jumping into the Escape Maker segment, um, learning a little bit more about an amazing restaurant up in the Hudson Valley called the Crimson Sparrow. So hang tight. We will be right back. And this one is called Relax, It's Just the End of the World by Star. We'll be right back. about New York's farmers. That's why we've developed the New York State Grown and Certified Program. It's a seal New Yorkers can look for when they're shopping for food that comes from local farms. 
Customers are more likely to buy food that has the New York State grown and certified seal because it tells them that it comes from a farm that follows environmentally responsible, farm safe protocols. In other words, the New York State grown and certified seal tells them their food is grown right, right here in New York State. You're a farmer with a lot to do, but the time it takes to sign up for the program is a great investment for your business because it lets shoppers know that your food meets higher standards, has passed assessments, and is produced by environmentally friendly farming practices. To learn about participating in the program, go to certified.ny.gov. All right, guys, we are back, and it is time for the Escape Maker segment. Today, we are taking a trip up to Hudson, New York. We are on the line with John McCarthy. John is the chef owner of the Crimson Sparrow. John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Erin. Great to be here. I am really uh, stoked to talk to you. Um, You have such an interesting kind of entree into cooking, and I'm hoping um, before we get into the what's what of the Crimson Sparrow, I want to hear a little bit more um, about your background. Now, you practice as an attorney for a couple of decades before attending the International Culinary Center. What was it that kind of, you know, pushed you into that transition? Uh, well, not that old, Aaron. It wasn't a couple of decades. It was about 15 years. But ah, well, I thought, I, I thought it, it was, was 20 years. So, you know no, what? Was, All right. It was, it was about 15. I was like, it's been 40 years, years John. <laughs> and now. It was 15 years, and then I decided <laughs> to start pursuing a career in the culinary field. Um, but that was 13 years too long. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, uh, after... Um, I, I made the decision, and it's something I always wanted to do, um, but I just uh, couldn't find the right uh, way or moment to do it. And uh, with the support of my uh, my beautiful wife, Diana, uh, she pushed me to do it, and I'm uh, such a happier uh, and more motivated person today for it. Um, so, yeah, I went to in the, uh, the well, it was French Culinary Institute at that point, now the International Culinary Center. And, um, you know, worked for a couple of years and then uh, opened the Crimson Sparrow in Hudson, New York in June of 2012. So we are in our fifth year in Hudson. Wow. So I know um, and, and from your bio that you spent a bit of time in Korea in your youth and then, you know, you got professionally trained at the French Culinary Institute. Um was there like a, um, a merging of, of cuisines that happened between the two? I mean, what is your kind of approach up at the Crimson Sparrow? And the Crimson Sparrow is, is you know, uh, as, as a, a French-trained uh, cook, um, I'm, I'm gravi- I gravitate and I'm drawn more to uh, Asian flavors and Asian flavor profiles, uh, in particular uh, Japanese. Um, I do draw a bit from Korea as well. Uh, we do uh, enjoy uh, making, eating kimchi. Uh, we use gochujang uh, quite heavily uh, in our in our dishes, uh, but, but primarily um, the cuisine is more has more of a um, a tilt towards uh, Japanese cuisine. Um, I, during my time in Korea, we did travel to Japan, and and in, I'd say in the last four years, I've been back to Japan probably at least five times. Um, and then I'm, I'm also going to Japan again this year in October to uh, do an event again uh, in Shizuoka Prefecture uh, within sight of Mount Fuji for Outstanding in the Field, which is a, just a tremendous event. That's in October. But uh, I get back to Japan as often as possible. Uh, I did visit Korea last year, um, and it was a, a remarkable, a remarkable trip. And then, too, you've developed quite a taste for sakes as well. That's correct. Um, uh, I actually uh, went through the the equivalent of uh, I guess the sake sommelier course um, in in New York, um, and uh, also have been in pretty serious study, if you can call it that, <laughs> uh, of Japanese uh, shochu of late. And um, I'm hoping to take the same course regards in regards to uh, shochu 
in the next, um, hopefully, next six months. Um, I'm really, uh, I really enjoy using uh, the sake uh, within our beverage pairing. I think it's a tremendous um, uh, beverage to pair w- with the food that we make, but also I think sake crosses over and can be paired with a lot of different cuisines and dishes. And, and you know, if you're if you're reading the uh, beverage news of late, uh, sake is really uh, having a great moment right now. Yeah, I'll say. Um, I feel like every time I turn around, there is like an emerging kind of sake pop-up, sake pairing, sake event. Um, it's an exciting time. So we're talking about, you know, French influence, uh, Korean influence, Japanese influence. Um, how do those things come together in upstate New York when you look at stuff like, you know, ingredient sourcing and presenting food that your, um, you know, customers are familiar with? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's fun because uh, many of the farmers that we use um, uh, for sourcing in Columbia County, uh, they all come to me at the end of the year. Uh, they're very interested in what, um, you know, what greens, what herbs, uh you know, what flavors uh, I'm looking for I haven't found yet or um, I've used and I'm, I'm looking for them to grow. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's because of me, but, uh, you know, I've noticed of, of late that there's a tremendous amount of, of you know, things like shiso uh, being grown. I'm still trying to find someone to grow mitsuba. Uh, but there's uh, the, the Asian greens uh, are hardy. And I think that they're well suited for Columbia County. So in the last four years, it's actually gotten very easy uh, in the summer to to get um, those products. And there seems to be a real interest in it. And, and I'm and I'm glad for that. I, I, I hope people uh, are finding their way to these products. Um, with respect to sake, uh, there's uh, not much <laughs> sake <laughs> being brewed in Columbia County. Yeah, that uh, hasn't but, caught on in the like enough, regional distillers. Fair enough, there are <laughs> sake breweries uh, popping up in the United States with increasing regularity. Uh, there's one in Maine, um, and there's they're they're coming. Don't worry. Um, and uh, <laughs> you know, we also we also use a domestic sake uh, called Soto Sake which is uh, owned by a gentleman um, named Billy Melnick. Um, and Mizu uh, Shochu, Shochu as well, uh, is being brought to the United States by Americans. Um, Jesse Fallowitz, uh, you know, works in, with a, uh, a distiller in Japan and markets something called Mizu Shochu, which is a barley shochu. It's delicious. So I think these things, the more they become familiar, then the more they're going to be accessible. And uh, hopefully in Columbia County, it becomes sort of a, a center of that. It would be great. Yeah, man. You're going to be like, I was here first. And we are like <laughs> building it. If you build no. it, they will come, right? No no one remembers the first one. The second <laughs> well, that was like the, you know, there was also like um, looking through your background, a little bit of a connection to us here at the Heritage Radio Network. I know when you were at FCI that you connected with Dave Arnold, who's been a longtime host on the network. He hosts a weekly show called Cooking Issues that really, um, you know, chronicles the modernist cuisine movement. Can you can you talk our modernist techniques like making their way into your culinary approach? Yeah, um, you know, Dave was uh, a huge influence on me, as was his uh, brother-in-law, Wiley Dufresne, um, and Niels Norin, who was also at FCI at the time. Um, uh, those three gentlemen made a huge impact. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we use uh, modernist techniques. Uh, I think they've become very commonplace now um, in, in kitchens across the United States and the world, um, primarily due to the work of uh, chefs like Wiley Dufresne um, and the work of, of folks like Dave Arnold. Um, so, yeah, we do use them. We don't... We don't uh, um, advertise them so much, but they are there. Um, I think that um, the, the day of uh, someone being wowed by, you know, uh, some gels and that kind of thing may be, may be over because they're so common, but, uh, you know, they're still a valuable tool uh, in our kitchen. And, you know, I, I've actually uh, talked to several Japanese chefs about those techniques uh, because they're not quite as familiar um, and there's a real interest 
um, in what I guess people would view as traditional Japanese chefs and traditional Japanese cooking, um, seeing how those techniques and those particular ingredients can be worked into the cuisine. Um, and it's been a fun, it's been sort of a fun interaction with me, uh, for me with the Japanese chefs that I know um, on, on, on that score. I love those types of exchange. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, as a New Yorker and we have a tendency in, in the city of thinking that we, you know, have invented everything. Um, I think <laughs> same goes for, uh, you know, it's like also the kind of bone that's thrown a lot of, thrown at a lot of millennials. And I think one of the things I find so interesting about Japanese cuisine is the deep connection to providence, to ingredient sourcing. And I'm wondering in your travels if you've had any opportunities to um, take a look at the agriculture systems in Japan or, or have observed the way Japanese chefs kind of interact with um, procurement. Sure. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, actually do a stage in uh, Tokyo at a restaurant called uh, Sukeroko. Um, it was uh, actually with the master of a, a very popular uh, sushi chef here in New York, uh, named Masato Shimizu, who was at 15 East. And, you know, every day, waking up at 4, 4.30 in the morning, going to Skiji Market uh, with the uh, chef, watching him select fish, uh, you know, just, it's a mind-boggling selection of fish at Skiji Market. Um, you know, this is a daily ritual. Um, you know, with respect to the farms, uh, I haven't been to many farms uh, in Japan, but, you know, there's, there's always... Um, uh, you know, the chefs are always looking for the freshest, best produce. Um, you know, I'm not sure if people know this, but at Skiji Market, there's also a very large uh, vegetable market as well. It is huge, uh, so it's just not fish. Uh, but, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the Japanese um, style of cooking and, you know, being tied to, you know, the, the locality, the prefecture, um, is is very very important, and uh, I think in many ways <clears throat> that's uh, uh, you know an ethos that I think American chefs are adopting very quickly. We use uh, probably four or five farms that are within three to five miles of our restaurant. Um, the closest one being about three quarters of a mile away, Letterbox Farmers, um, but we use Blue Star Farms, which is in Stuyvesant, in New York. Uh, Common Hands Farm, which is in Ghent, uh, Max Morningstar Farms, which is in Copac. I mean, these are all very close to the restaurant. Um, so there's really, uh, with with the bounty we have in Columbia County, there's been little reason to go beyond, um, you know, Columbia County. So it's it's much the same uh, type of mentality, and and you know, that's when we're blessed and fortunate to have it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it must be. I feel like this time of year too must be super fun. Um, I love kind of, you know, late summer, early fall. It, you're kind of rich in opportunity, rich in choices, especially when you're looking for stuff to bring back to the kitchen. Um, any plans you want to give us a hint of for your fall menus? Uh, well, uh, September's going to be quite busy uh, for us. We uh, are doing um, a pop-up in, um, not a pop-up, we're doing an event with Outstanding in the Field September 21st. Uh, we're doing it in conjunction with, in collaboration with uh, Chef Huni Kim uh, from uh, Hanjan and Danji. Yeah, in, I in love New those York spots. City. Yeah, <clears throat> he's phenomenal. And uh, we're then going to go to Japan uh, for a dinner uh, in Shizuoka Prefecture uh, on October fourth. Um, and then after that, our fall menu will start in earnest, and it changes uh, from the uh, summer menu quite. Uh, Gradually, but then drastically, uh, it becomes more of a, a fuller, richer, um, even more umami-laden menu, uh, which is really uh, a lot of fun. And we also get to use, um, you know, dashi and, and hot broths, which is uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, things on the menu. Well, get it's all come. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, get the up to Hudson, New York. Um, John, thank you so much. It's been a real treat kind of uh, getting the lowdown and learning a little bit more about you and your background. Fantastic. Great to be with you. So, folks, that is The Crimson Sparrow. You can find them at thecrimsonsparrow.com. And, of course, we connected with them via our friends at Escape Maker. 
uh, definitely check out escapemaker.com. They can help you book your uh, dream, your dream weekend, day, getaway, whatever it may be. Maybe you have a week. Maybe you have two weeks. Go crazy. Uh, lots to see and do here in the Northeast, and we thank them for their support of the network. You have made it. We are done. That has been a wrap. Uh, it's another episode of The Farm Report. Thank you so much for listening. Stay tuned in. Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. Listeners, we want to tell you about a podcast we're really digging. It's called Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Radio. Every week, they travel the world to find the most fascinating stories about food, including children who harvest cod tongues after school in Norway and a detective who tracks down food thieves. And on Milk Street Radio, you can always find the unexpected. The comedian who ranks apples using an elaborate 100-point system, the secret history of grocery stores, and how to eat your way through Italy. They also interview the most beloved names in food like Jacques Pepin, Sola Aweli, Jose Andres, Jettila, Ina Garten, Nigella Lawson, and Padma Lakshmi. Plus, co-hosts Christopher Kimball and Sarah Moulton do live calls with listeners and answer their questions about ingredients, techniques, and culinary mysteries. Like, why roasting a leg of lamb made one collar's oven explode? Ever wonder why your bread won't rise or your souffle falls flat? Chris and Sarah have the answers. You'll also hear from a rotating cast of contributors, including Kenji Lopez-Alt, Cheryl Day, Dan Pashman from The Sporkful, and Alex Inews, a French guy cooking from YouTube. Take a listen at 177milkstreet.com radio, or just search your podcast app for Milk Street Radio.